I'm very excited to welcome you tonight to a very special event. I'm John Racanelli. I'm the CEO of the Aquarium. And uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to tonight's Marjorie Lynn Bank Lecture and with a really special guest whom I'm going to introduce in a couple minutes. For many of you who know this, um, this series is designed to bring, Baltimore bring to Baltimore individuals who have devoted themselves to creating positive change, um, whether it's in addressing climate change and promoting resiliency, improving ocean and human health, or building much needed diversity in our conservation space. We also believe these stories can offer insights and inspiration from people that are both local, regional, and even national and international to help make this blue planet a better and healthier place for all of us. We've had the ple pleasure of hosting Marjorie Lynn Bank lecturers now for 15 years, thanks to the generosity of the Bank family. And Marjorie was a diver, a photojournalist, an environmentalist, and an explorer. She passed away in 1994. And when she did, her family endowed this lecture series in her honor. So it's been a wonderful thing for us to be able to share her love of the ocean and her sense of adventure with a community of like-minded people. That's you guys. Um, you know, in addition to recognizing the Bank family, I'd also like to acknowledge the entire Aquarium family, our board of directors, our members, our donors. <clears throat> it's really our donors and members who make it possible for us to connect people with the aquatic world through our exhibits and our education programs, our conservation initiatives, and everything else. I'd also like to acknowledge our own staff and volunteers, many of whom are here tonight. Staff and volunteers that are here, give me a little shout out. <laughs> Woohoo! All right, cool. Um, and this is an amazing team of people who not only work hard, but also care very, very deeply. Um, and I want to give a special welcome to some really important friends of ours, our colleagues from the University of Maryland's IMET uh, Institute right across the street. Uh, where's our IMET folks? Give me a wave. All right. Hey, Russell, good to see you guys. I just learned there's a connection here with our speaker that you'll hear about more in a moment. So this evening's event coincides with our Urban Climate Na Action Network Conference, um, also called UCAN. UCAN empowers teens particularly those from communities most affected by the impacts of climate change, to, to connect with peers in other cities to discuss environmental, social, and economic challenges, and also to take action to hopefully create better places to live and work, play, and be. So we have UCAN participants here tonight from Baltimore, Maryland, Chicago, Illinois, Farmington, New Mexico, Long Beach, California, Moss Point, Mississippi, Orlando, Florida, Powhatan, Kansas, and Pongo Pongo American Samoa. Will you join me in welcoming our UCAN people today? OK, a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, if you submitted a question online, uh, we have those. And we thank you for sending them in. Online submissions is closed right now, but we have distributed index cards. You should have gotten one, or they're available somewhere here. Um, and we encourage you to jot a question if you have one for our speaker. And we'll collect these at the beginning of the Q&A session um, after she speaks. I'd also like to take a quick moment now to also introduce Brianna Smith, who is going to moderate the Q&A portion later this evening. Brianna, give a wave. <laughs> Bri is an assistant education specialist here at the Aquarium, born and raised in Baltimore City. Uh, joined our after-school work-study program for, free, for high school students when she was a junior, then went on to earn a degree in environmental studies from UMBC. Yay, way to go. And lucky for us, came to work at the aquarium. In fact, continued to work at the aquarium the whole way through. So it's going to be fun to get Bree and Nadia together. And that is our speaker tonight, Ms. Nadia Nazar. And she was also born and raised in the Baltimore area. Um, and when she's not on the front lines of organizing climate action, she's still a high school student about to begin her senior year this fall. Um, Nadia co-founded and is now co-leader and art director for Zero Hour, which you'll be hearing about tonight. And it's an organization that ensures that the voices of young people are heard and considered and taken into account by decision makers in conversations about climate change, in fact, nationally and internationally. The Zero Hour movement started with several, six, several young people, including a 16-year-old named Jamie Margolin, 
who was frustrated by the inaction of elected officials and the fact that youth voices were almost always ignored in the conversation around climate change, despite the profound impact that younger generations will face. We had a youth climate lobby day where over 100 youth um, lobbied to their, their senators asking them to sign the no fossil fuel money pledge, which um, basically ensures that they're not going to be taking money from fossil fuel corporations and that they won't take that bribery into account for stopping climate legislation. So um, we had the youth climate lobby day and we also had um, a youth climate art festival where we embraced art, culture, and different aspects that can help movement build and, and build this movement. So this is our logo. This is a logo that I designed for Zero Hour. And what it is, is it's a, it's a ticking clock. And we're saying that we only have a certain amount of time left to so solve climate change. And that's how we as young people feel, right? Um, all the young people in the room kind of testify to this, that um, we, we only have a certain amount of time left to stop climate change. And, and once that time's up, we're, we're done for. So, so we're saying that we have a little sliver of hope left. And that's what that, that orange in the continent is. So this past weekend, we had our Youth Climate Summit down in Miami, Florida. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to highlight the voices in Miami, which is a frontline community. But not only is it a frontline community, but it's a community with a huge Hispanic population, Haitian population, Cuban population. So we really wanted to, to embrace those voices in Miami. And at that summit, we had um, different um, workshops and trainings for people, like a lobby training and um, a workshop in like art and activism and different things to help people um, build movements and, and get into climate organizing because a lot of us a lot of young people know that they want to take action But we need to have the skills and the resources in order to actually go out and organize So that summit um, was able to, to give a lot of people the resources they need to, to go out and or organize in their communities and, and the presentation I'm giving to you guys today is called um, Getting to the Roots of Climate Change. This is a campaign that Zero Hour released a few months ago where peers are being trained and um, people are being trained and then they're, they're presenting this to their peers. And um, it, it's all about climate justice and a lot of, that, of what Zero Hour focuses on is the intersections of race, identity, gender, and how that um, affects how people are affected by climate change. So we talk a lot about racism, colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism being um, main components of the climate crisis. So these are some photos of last year. That's us with Bernie Sanders at our lobby day. These are different photos of us at our march. It did. It rained heavily on that day, and so it was really powerful. We were all like marching, marching through the rain. So these are our guiding principles. I'm going to read them off to you. As a movement, we believe those who are on the front lines of any movement should lead that movement. Youth leadership is transformational and visionary. Youth must lead because they have always shifted culture, culture towards, progressive, towards progress and collective liberation. In this movement, we will be peaceful and nonviolent. We will extend the hand of friendship. We will demand that our allies take action in solidarity with us. We affirm that climate change is real, indigenous rights must be honored, Animals are on the front lines. Nature is the most powerful force. Each generation must learn from each other. Black lives matter. People with disabilities must be included and respected. So this is a content advisory warning. We do have um, mentions of war, slavery, and death. So as I said before, we focus on the intersections of a lot of systems of oppression. And we, we include how these systems of oppression are in the cause and the effect of climate change. These systems have kind of led our, our society in a place where a lot of people leading society for years and years, decades before now, have, have been a certain group of people and they've made decisions that have been for the benefit of some people but also for the oppression of others. So we want to make sure that in our climate solutions when we move forward talking about climate change that we don't perpetuate these systems in our solutions or else we're kind of just going backwards again. So the, the four ones that we're going to focus on today are capitalism, patriarchy, racism, and colonialism. So colonialism, how many of you guys have seen this image? Like history class, a lot of us learn about this of manifest destiny and how the US, we, we felt the need to, to go out west and to colonize out west like it was some, some god-given um, journey. So you can see um, there are people moving out, the indigenous people from their land, and how technology is kind of uh, going that way. So a lot of with what we see with co colonialism is with like the fossil fuel industry. So colonialism can be thought as control over a piece of land and by it 
and of land and its people by a more dominant power. So in this, in this image, um, the, the more red areas are areas that emit more carbon, and um, the bluer areas are ones that, that have a lower carbon footprint by the people. And, and what we're seeing a lot is that the areas that are being, um, that are emitting less carbon are being impacted more. And, and we, we see that a lot with animals too. A lot of animals are, are dying, going endangered. And there was a species recently that went extinct because of climate change, but animals have not caused this crisis. We have, and, and we're kind of being the last ones that are being affected. But, but we can see that like the Western areas, America, or the United States is, is, has been kind of impacted less. And yes, we are being impacted right now, but we, we've been ignoring the impacts that other nations have been receiving, even though they're not emitting as much carbon as, as we do in our lifestyles. So this is a quote by John Bolton. So, so we see colonialism as a lot. Uh, we, we go, we're going into the Middle East, we're going into different areas and we're taking their resources, you know, we're taking fossil fuels from them and oil from them. We, we see colonialism as, we, we kind of like disturb their lifestyle, you know? So many people had really good lifestyles going on where they were working with the land and we have indigenous people that worked with the land and not really against it for years and years. And with colonialism, um, imperialists kind of went and disrupted that lifestyle and, and we, we made it into a toxic way, a toxic lifestyle that we're now living. So racism, are we able to play the, the video? So environmental racism is a really huge issue and um, it, it's really only being mentioned and talked about recently, but it's something that we should all be talking about more so we can make sure that we can eradicate it. And a lot of people, when I talk about this, people, people are like, oh, you think air is racist? Do you think nature is racist? It, it, it's not, it's we're, we're using our advantage as people to exploit nat nature and natural resources in order to harm people while uplifting others. So, so things like clean air and clean water shouldn't be available for only some people. It shouldn't only be available to white communities. It should be available to every single person because clean air and clean water is needed to live. So, so we're in a lot. There's a lot of cases where fossil fuel plants and different plants are being put in low minority black and brown neighborhoods, and and. Um, for example, black children are four times more likely to die from asthma than white children. So, so you're seeing a lot of statistics and a lot of air pollution happening in, in black and lower income communities. And, and this is something that we, we, that people did to them. You know, you know, we, this isn't like you're randomly placing a fossil fuel plant somewhere. They're being strategically planned to harm certain people. So this video just talks about how environmental racism is the new Jim Crow, and our access to um, being able to, to use resources is giving people the power to, to oppress other people, um, especially with natural resources and just life, you know, living, we should, we should be able to have access still, to the resources. It's no wonder that black and Hispanic children have the highest rates of asthma, or that hurricanes like Katrina, Sandy, and Matthew did their worst damage in communities of color. Rich white neighborhoods can update their water pipes, but not places like Flint. The Jim Crow laws are dead and gone, but the fact that people of color are still more likely to die from environmental causes is no accident. So with the prison industrial complex, we were seeing that black and brown people are more likely to be incarcerated and harshly to be to have longer sentences, to have harsher sentences than, than white people. So we're seeing in, in prison labor, people are being paid low, low wages to do harmful things like um, natural disaster cleanup and, you know, to go into areas where there might be pathogens and, you know, a dangerous place to do, do cleanup. And we're, we're, a lot of prisoners have to, have to do, do that for low wages. And, and there are also many protocols in prisons where prison, prisoners will be left behind while guards will leave if there's a certain, certain situation like, like floods and different things like that. So capitalism, who here likes capitalism? 
And this is some. This is kind of a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. But we we do say that capitalism kind of caused climate change, and there are many capitalistic ways to approach climate change, like carbon pricing and um, carbon fee and dividend and di different things like that that we, that we don't necessarily agree with because we don't see um, putting a price on carbon as as an effective solution to the climate crisis. So we, we see a lot of, uh, with capitalism, we see a lot of like consumerism. You know, you know, we don't think about the things that we're buying. For, for example, we kind of see like a $5 t-shirt and we're like, oh, it's just $5, but you don't think really deeply into what it is, how many resources you need in order to make that t-shirt and how transportation and different things like that. And, and it's a, a lot of resources are being wasted. And with capitalism, you can see with, like, with the plastic issue, we're constantly taking things in and, and wasting it and, and disposing of things. So it's creating a lot of waste and, and destruction. And with capitalism, we have the fossil fuel industries that keep taking power. You know, They keep bribing our elected officials, and it's causing a lack of climate action. ExxonMobil knew about climate change 50 years ago. They, they were the ones that hired scientists to, to look into what they were doing, and they, were, they had the first climate scientists. And when they got that report back, they decided not to act on anything. They decided to push their agenda of fossil fuels more instead of transitioning into renewable energy. So we're seeing a lot of, we, we call action to the government officials, but we all also need to be holding corporations accountable. A lot of corporations are siding with fossil fuel companies, and we, we don't really see that, but there's such a big influence on us. And, and this also has to do with like guilt tripping us. You know, people are always like, oh, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm being really bad for the planet because I didn't use, uh, I used a plastic straw instead of like a metal straw, but there's also like systematic change. You know, we're, we're kind of trapped in this system where we're forced to use certain things, forced to do things in order to live efficiently. We're forced to kind of have a, ca a car to, to transport, even though we only have public transport in, in certain cities. So we, we need to shift our culture and our lifestyle to like away from, from capitalism and, and from the ways that we're living to, to ensure that everybody can, can live sustainably. So patriarchy is um, the dominance of men over women, but we, we also talk as of patriarchy kind of as the, the dominance of certain people over other people, like able-bodied people over disabled people, of humans over animals, and different things like that. So over 80, the UN reported that over 80% of people displaced by climate change are women, and, and women have been affected by different things. Um, women are more likely to be homeless, and, and we, we face a lot of different things. And, and women, we also have to talk about women in like the global south, for example. Girls, um, their schools, they, they'll be turned into shelters during natural disasters, so they'll, they'll, their education will stop. Or um, in natural disasters, um, people are more likely to save the men because they're, they're financially able to support the children, but the women are not. And there's also the situation in natural disaster struck areas, sexual assault increases because there's less security and less safety for girls and women. So, so there are lots of effects on, on girls as climate change and as natural disasters increases. So the industrial animal agriculture industry is a huge cause of climate change, and it's something that a lot of us don't like to talk about because if we talk about it, if we feel like you can't really eat meat and do things like that. So um, the industrial animal agriculture cause, causes about 14.5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, and, and this, is, um, this is through the waste of, of the animals. You have cows producing methane all the time, but it's also um, unsustainable how we're growing and growing more and more animals. There's so many animals that we keep breeding and growing. And then another thing is we have to use our water to feed these animals. We have to use our crops to feed these animals when we could be using th that water and those crops to, to feed people, you know? And another thing is these these um, factories are, are down in like Brazil and South America and different parts of the world. So we have to pay for transportation of, of those, um, those meats and materials all the way up to here in the US when really we could just be getting locally su sourced meat, supporting our local farmers and, and, and businesses and, and getting meat locally. But also reducing your meat intake is, is really important. This is something that you can do as an individual, but we should also be holding really big corporations accountable for, for doing this. So climate change affects disabled people as well and um, in different ways. We, we saw that with the, the forest fires in California, a huge portion of the people that died were, were elderly people because they were left in the elderly homes instead of, 
instead of being taken and cared for. And, you know, when someone's in a wheelchair, people have the, the need to, you know, not, not help them and make sure that they, they get to safety. And, and a lot of this is just like vulnerability in general. With climate change, climate change is increasing the harshness of our weather, the harshness of climate. And there are certain people that have the resources and the shelter in order to survive, but there are people that don't. And, you know, we have homeless people dying in Chicago from the polar, polar vortex because they don't have shelter, they don't have heat to survive. So when we talk about climate change, we have to talk about the vulnerability of certain groups of people. Um, for example, trans people, um, there are many trans people that are homeless, kicked out of their homes because of transphobia. So there are many trans people that, that have died from, from climate change induced natural disasters. So this is about the, the California forest fires. So in our, in our solutions, in our climate solutions, we have to make sure that we're helping everybody and we're making sure that everybody has um, resources in order to survive the crisis. So structural changes that will be needed is we need local schools to implement climate justice education. A lot of schools don't even teach their students about climate change. Um, local and community farming, sustainable autonomous housing, housing urge lo lo urging local, local elected officials to create affordable mass transit systems. Structural changes needed some more. So we need to address transition from fossil fuel energy in order in renewable energy. A lot of people think that we can just leave coal miners behind and people that have been part of the system because they need a job, you know. So we need to make sure that we're taking everybody with us. We're making sure that people that worked in the fossil fuel industries are, are getting jobs in renewable energy and, and making sure no one is left behind. We need to recognize systems of oppression and demand a livable earth that we all deserve. So making sure that these systems of oppression aren't perpetuated in our solutions and also making sure that in, our, in the conversations we have, we have a diverse group of people at our table. We have different people from different backgrounds and different perspectives. So we're including everybody in the conversation because it's one thing to listen to people and to hear people, but to actually include them in your conversation is very different. So these are different things that you can do to help. Um, we have Zero Hours People's Platform at our website, this is zerohour.org. And the people's, people's Platform is more of what you can do as an individual. Um, you can get your school to pass a climate resolution. I know Baltimore County um, is currently doing that. And um, it, it calls to action of the local elected officials to, to take climate action. Divest money from national banks to credit unions. Reduce meat consumption from industrial producers. Do your best to support businesses that have divested from fossil fuels. So there's a huge movement of divesting money from fossil fuel industries and investing that money into renewable energy. Supporting elected officials who believe in climate justice and urge your local effect elected officials to take the no fossil fuel money pledge. Start or join a local zero hour chapter of your own. So we have zero hour chapters everywhere. We have one in like Los Angeles, DC, New York City's pretty big, Miami, but, but you're always welcome to, to start a chapter and you can see which ones are already there on our, on our website. So if you guys would like to follow us, we, we do post a lot about different actions that we're doing um, and things like that. And we, our website is, is pretty cool. We have our platform, which has um, the different things that, that we urge people to take action on. And on our Instagram and our social medias, we, we always share stories of people that are affected by climate change so a lot of people can see like what's actually happening right now because we talk about how climate change is going to affect our future, but we don't really um, see where it's happening and, and where it's um, causing suffering right now. And yeah, so, so that's our logo. And yes, thank you for listening. Thank you, Nadia, for sharing your experience with us. That was super inspirational. Um, so we're going to open up the audience to hand in questions. Me? Is your mic on? Is it on? Yeah. It's on. OK. We're going to open up the audience to answer questions so we can have a discussion. Um, Maggie is coming around to collect questions. You can pass them on. And we'll answer as many questions as we can that we have allotted for this time period. Just to start, um, Nadia, so who are some of your heroes? You've done a lot of things. Who inspires you? I, I think it's definitely the, the people on the front lines that are fighting, like the, the indigenous people blocking pipelines. You know, they're putting their actual life 
on the, on the line to, to, to protect their clean air and water and to see to see people working so hard to, to protect, protect their land and protect their life is is really inspiring because a lot of the work I do is like I sit at home on my computer sending emails making graphics doing things like that and also like rallying and doing actions marching and stuff like that but but it, it's different when you actually like go out and put your life on the line I think it's really inspiring that that people are doing that. Cool. You mentioned that you you do graphics, so you're the art director for Zero Hour. Could you talk more about how art and climate action are interconnected? Yeah, so I, I like to use art um, as a tool for awareness. Um, I use personally use like art, painting, sculpture, graphics, animation to, to bring awareness to climate change and different issues because I feel like art is um, such a universal thing because it's so hard to get people to actually listen to the words that you speak sometime but for them to just like look at an image or hear music and, and kind of be able to understand how you feel about something is, is really different. And I think, I think it's also really good for movement building. We had our um, Youth Climate Summit this past weekend and we had our like a Friday night kickoff event last Friday where we had like break dancers and musicians and, and different people performing like henna tattoos and different things to get like people like really activated and like really excited to join the movement and it's really good to, to be able to like branch out and, and have people use different tools for the movement. Cool. Um, what are a few key takeaways from the events at Zero Hour that Zero Hour has organized like last year's Climate March and last weekend's Youth Climate Summit? Yeah, so I, I think um, movement building is really important, getting more people in the movement, more people activated to take action um, on climate change. I think it's really important to also know about accountability and how we have to hold the government, how we have to hold corporations accountable. Um, with last year's march, like, how are we able to get our message across to legislators? Because, yes, we're marching in a street, but how are we going to make sure that they hear about us? How are we going to make sure that they listen to us so it's seeking different ways in order to do that. But um, and from this last this past week's summit, um, being able to like expand and, and give resources and help other people join the movement, not just being like, oh, join us, but, but actually giving them the resources and training in order to do so. How do you and Zero Hour members deal with internet trolls? We, <laughs> we, um, we normally tend to ignore them. Especially when we talk about like these systems of repression in our posts, we get like a lot of like, um, a lot of people are like, "Oh my God, they're just dumb kids eating Tide Pods." Even though that was like a thing two years ago, it's not anymore. <laughs> yeah, that they people still use that. Like two years ago, there was like comments on stuff like, "They're just eating Tide Pods. Don't listen to them." But people still use that. Um, yeah, we just kind of tend to ignore it because we know that there are a lot of people that support us and we want to focus on the good things that we can do. We don't want to take our energy to, to you know, combat these trolls because once you reply, then they keep replying and it's just annoying. So, yeah, we, we'd rather spend our time and energy doing actual action rather than, than trying to prove someone wrong that you know, like, they're not going to change their mind. Could you explain some of the capitalism-based solutions, why you think they won't work, and suggest an alternative? Yeah, so some of the capitalism-based alternatives are putting a price on carbon. I think it's kind of odd that you would put like a price on, on like a gas, you know, it's kind of weird. But um, part of it is, is like the, like the monopoly believe that, that, that it could create, like, because um, the corporations and big mis businesses would be able to afford to pay that, to pay the carbon tax and be able to, um, you know, keep, keep polluting the earth. It really doesn't stop anyone from fully polluting the earth. And yes, it, it would lessen their need to, their want, their desire to, like, admit carbon. But um, we're also talking about, like, local businesses, too, and could they afford a carbon tax? And they might be in a situation where they, they, they have to emit carbon in order to, to keep their business up. But instead, I think transitioning to renewable energy would be better and just getting our whole economy, our whole society on renewable energy rather than like relying on people to just lessen and lessen their carbon emissions. Especially since we only have a certain amount of time left, I feel like it's a slower approach as well because the UNIPCC released a report saying that we, we only have 11 years till 2030 to, to to take action on climate change or else we, we reach a point where it's irreversible. So I think for us, it's like a really daunting number, you know, 11 years um, until 11 more years to act. So I think transitioning to renewable energy now is the fastest and best approach that we have. Do you currently have native people presented in zero hour? 
Yes, we, we do have um, Native people, a few Native people in our organization, but we do make sure that our, our events have um, Native people and Native voices. This past weekend at um, our Youth Climate Summit, um, we, we had Nathan Phillips. He was, um, do you guys know who Nathan Phillips is? He was the one that, um, that there was like an, an incident that happened a few months ago where he, he, there was like a MAGA hat kid at like a march and he, there was an incident on the news. If you Google him, you'll know who he is. But he, he's amazing. He spoke at our event as well as his daughter and we had a whole panel of, of um, standing rock water protectors and indigenous women that talked about their experiences and that was a really inspiring panel um, that happened last weekend. How can I get my school to make a pledge? Yeah, do you mean like a climate resolution? Who asked that question? Oh yeah, uh, do you mean like the climate resolution? Yeah, so um, there's actually an organization that focuses on that. They're called Schools for Climate Action. They're mainly based in Sonoma County, California, but they, they do it all over. And they already have them written up. You just have to kind of edit it for your local area, edit it um, like to be um, more centered around um, Baltimore, I'm assuming you're from here, um, and, and and then kind of just present it to like your student council or your student board, and, and they can definitely help you with that process, and I can connect you to them if you're interested. What plans do you and Zero Hour have for future climate activism? So um, we have the September 20th strikes happening. I don't know if you all heard about that, but Greta Thunberg is organizing um, another like massive global strike that we like we had on March 15th, um, and. So that's September 20th, and what's gonna be different about that, it's not only gonna be youth striking, but we're calling on adults to strike too, to strike from their workplace and you know walk out and join the youth and have a huge mass mobilization in September. So that, that'll be happening September 20th, ahead of the, the UN Youth Climate Summit, Summit happening in New York City. Um, and we also have some pretty big plans for Earth Day 2020. Are you encouraging students to off colleagues if they have to what? To off? Oh, ask. Ask colleagues if they've... <laughs> I thought this one was violent. <laughs> Could you just like repeat the whole thing? Yeah, are you encouraging students to ask colleagues if they've diverted friends away from fossil fuels? Yeah, I definitely think that we should increase the conversation about climate change. I didn't really fully understand the question, but. What was the question? I'm sorry, my handwriting is horrible. What was the question? Are you encouraging students to ask colleges and universities if they have divested their funds out of fossil fuels before they That is a really good question. Thank, thank you, yeah. That um, makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. It's a completely different question, too. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we've been, I, I don't think we were asking colleges to divest before students go, and that, that's something that we're going to be focusing on this next year about college divestment, because a lot of our um, people internally have graduated from high school and are moving to college um, these next few years. So we, 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 are, we, are, we are like partnered with the, the Harvard divestment movement, but that's only Harvard. There's so many other colleges but I think basically almost all colleges, pretty big colleges, are, are affiliated with fossil fuel um, industries in some way. So, so we're, we're trying to have students go into that college and then ask their, their college, like, why are you taking money from fossil fuel corporations? Can you divest from them, please? And it's really hard to get um, colleges to listen because, you know, they get a lot of money, and money is power, and we have greed and everything. So that is something that we're going to be focusing on this next year, and if any of you guys are our college students definitely urge your, your campus to, to divest. Can you talk about the legislative successes your work has achieved? Yeah, so I, we, we, I think we, we kind of see it as like small changes. We can't necessarily say, oh, we certainly did this or this, but we did have over 100 youth lobbying to, to the 50, 50 Democratic senators and asking them to sign the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge. And a lot of it is put, pushing putting pressure on elected officials and making sure that they understand that they're, we're, like a, we're like a rock on their back where we're all gonna, always going to be pressuring them and we're, we're letting them know that we're not going to be voting for them um, this upcoming year if they don't take climate action, if they don't take climate change seriously. So um, yeah, and I, was, I testified at the 
the House Natural Resources Committee on Climate Change, Committee Hearing on Climate Change. And so I, I represented young people at that hearing and it was good to talk directly to, to some congressional members about um, climate change and the experience we young, we young people have with that. The climate emergency is a daunting topic and it can help to talk about and it can help to talk about solutions. What do you see as some success stories? Yeah, I definitely agree talking about like the hopeful side and positive side is helpful because a lot of people talk about climate change and they get depressed and depressed but talking about like the uplifting stories is great. I think talking about like youth successes, you know, when you see like little kids going into their their local um, school boards and, and making action and actually succeeding. You know, with the Baltimore Beyond Plastic, with when they succeeded with getting the the foam ban, that was that was amazing. That was super uplifting. And I think talking about um, young people's success stories and and seeing the power that one young person can have is amazing. Studies about climate communication point to the importance of having regular climate conversations with family and friends. How often do you work climate into the conversation, and do you have any creative tips for doing so? Yeah, so I'm I'm not too great at working climate into conversations. I kind of just bring it up randomly. My friends kind of get annoyed <laughs> at me all the time. I'm always kind of talking about it. Um, but I, I think like whenever you see like an alleyway to do so, you should do it. Because climate change is connected to so many things that we, we don't think about. It's connected to immigration, healthcare, um, just general health. And it's connected to so many other issues we talk about. I think increasing the, the, the conversation about that and how, you, you know, there will be mass migration because people will be displaced from their homes from natural disasters. And, you, you know, talking about like the small changes that we see, like me personally, I haven't been able to see like huge changes, but it's been interesting for me to see, you know, flooding happening in my home in Kerala, India, and also flooding happening in like Ellicott City. And it was, it was like flooding the other day in, in par some parts of Maryland. So to see like flooding in both parts of, of my world was like interesting. So when, when things happen like that, when you see like random natural disasters happening where so many people are getting hurt, you know, mentioning, you know, this is one of the, the effects of climate change and, and, and talking, making those relations and openly saying them so people understand that and people are more willing to pass that message on. How was talking at the UN? It was, it was nice. So I was um, invited to speak for the International Day of the Girls Summit which was last October 11th. Um, they do it every year where they have some girls speak about um, certain issues. So I spoke with um, someone who was affected by climate change by a typhoon in the Philippines. And um, so I was able to speak to how girls are affected by climate change and how, you know, in natural disaster struck areas, sexual assault increases, what I was saying earlier about how, how girls are on the front lines of, of the climate crisis and how they're affected. It, it was really cool speaking there, I was like, I got my little name tag, and there were a few um, UN ambassadors there. Are there hospitals or medical systems that are joining the effort or dedicating themselves to climate-friendly practices and policies? I don't know for sure about that. I'm assuming that there are, but I, don't, I haven't heard from, from anyone about that yet. Um, how do you get people to listen who won't? I, for me, I think using art, as I said before, using art like visual images can, can captivate people and kind of you can send your message on. But um, I think also just doing like calmly, like don't argue or really debate. Well, well not debate, but don't, don't argue, don't be like passionate about it or else they're gonna just keep riling you up because they wanna see you mad, they wanna see you angry. And just kind of being calm, full about it and, and presenting different sides of the argument, presenting like facts, but also how you feel about it and, and different like resources. So it's not just being like, oh yeah, I think climate change is real, but like, yes, climate change is real. The UN has reported it. The UN has like said these statistics, these X, Y, Z, you know, so providing factual support is, is always good and relevant. I would like to open up the floor for more questions. If we have more questions. All right now. We, we don't have a zero hour in the county or the city. I'm, I'm trying to find someone to organize it. If you're interested in organizing one in the city, I'd love to connect with you, yeah, about that. It was just recently started, so um, they're currently growing, but I'm sure if you reach out to them now, they'd love to have you. 
we're gonna go here first, sorry. How would you address people who believe in the notions that climate change is a... Should I? Who? <laughs> Okay, no, I got this. Um, <laughs> is a process or cycle that Earth goes through? Oh, is a natural. Got you. I, I think talking about the effects, you know, I, I the way I picture it is like Earth was like a living system. It, it's constantly living, then we come and we disrupt it with our man-made, um, man-made things like different factories and different things like that. I, I don't know if that's easy to put into words, but um, I, I think talking about the statistics, there are a lot of statistics about how humans have caused climate change. And yes, you can talk about the climactic change that was there before, but that was slower and animals were able to, some animals were able to adapt to it. But this this climactic change, you can it's really harsh. And I think it's happening so all of a sudden where we're seeing that a lot of animals can't adapt to it, we're seeing all these effects. And, and we humans can't even adapt to it that fast enough where we're not that, that wise too. So I would say supporting with a lot of facts and statistics would be great. Would you be willing to speak at the Native Youth Community Adaptation and Leadership Congress 2020? Oh, could you repeat that? <laughs> Would you be willing to speak at the Native Youth Community Adaptation and Leadership Congress 2020? I would love to, yes. Cool. <laughs> Do we have someone from here? From, from there? Is... Oh, wow. Hi. OK, do we have more questions? There's a bunch of hands. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so how did you get, uh, how did you start getting involved with creating co-founding Zero Hour? Yeah, so it, it, a lot of it was like coincidence. It was kind of weird. So at my school, I read an article. Um, it was, I was like reading like a teen magazine thing at class, right, because I had a few extra minutes in class. And there was an article on climate change. It was like an open letter to climate change deniers. So I, I saw that someone wrote it. Um, it said Jamie Margolin. So I was like, okay. I took a photo of it. Then I... I, I like searched her up on Instagram and I found her account. I followed her and I DM'd her. We kind of just started talking. She was taking a lot of action like locally and I wasn't. I wanted to, to be better and take more action at that time. This was when I was 15, so like two years ago. Exactly two years ago, actually. I, I DM'd her tomorrow, two years ago. So yeah, and then so we kind of just started getting talking and the, the idea of the Youth Climate March was her idea and she finally posed it out and was like, okay, I'm actually going to do it. Does anyone want to help me? And I was just like, yeah, I'll help you. And then that, that's how we got started. I think a lot of it is movement building and recruitment, you know, reaching out to schools. Um, last year for our climate march in DC, we had two native organizers that went out um, into different schools, different communities, different programs, talking about climate change and the effect it would have have on young people. So, so talking to people about it, engaging people in, in the movement, I think is really important. So, so we were able to kind of attain people that way. But we were also able to get people into the movement with social media. I think storytelling is really important, telling the, the people that are affected, telling their stories and how you know, young people can do this rather than just being like, oh, here are some data and facts about, about climate change, but also interwinding that data with storytelling and, and being able to, to present your story on social media. OK, I have two. What does feminism and the LGBTQ plus community have to do with climate change? Yeah, so um, feminism in, in general, I don't know if you meant like more of how girls are affected or how like the, the fight for, for um, equal rights, but um, I, I, I would say, as I said before, you know, girls are more affected by climate change um, than, than others and, and we're, we're constantly being affected by climate, especially in the global south, as I said before, with natural disasters and sexual assault and education, climate change is stopping education for certain girls in areas. So making sure that we uplift girls to, to have more opportunities and education in order to, to continue to live and, and thrive, not only to survive in their, their life. And, and for the LGBTQ plus community, um, 
a lot of homophobia and transphobia is causing pain and suffering to those people, to that community. And we have to make sure we uplift those people because a lot of that community um, is homeless. A lot of that community lacks resources to, to different things because of the homophobia and transphobia that might be present in their home. So, so you know, talking about vulnerability and the lack of access to resources in order to survive the harsh, um, the harsh living elements that climate change will bring. But we do want to make sure that everybody is included in the conversation, that, that um, LGBTQ people are included, that women are included, that people of color are included, indigenous people are included. And, and that's what we kind of see at Zero Hour. We are like a diverse group of people. Um, the majority of our team are women, are women of color too, and are, they, they are part of the LGBTQ plus community. So, so we are seeing that this, this table that we've created by ourselves is diverse, and we're making sure that we're continuing to be diverse and inclusive. Of, of other voices and of other people to make sure they're a part of our conversation how our team moves forward. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Two more. Yes. Yeah, so I, I personally want to keep Zero Hours like a youth-led movement as like high school-led because I, I think we're really unconventional in that way in the way we work. Um, I personally will be going into like the arts, animation, things like that as I get older, and I want to make um, animations about um, about climate stories and different things like that. But I think definitely growing Zero Hour to be a huge powerhouse. We are international already. We have chapters in India, the UK, um, and, and we recently had one open in Iraq, and it was really cool. So, so we have um, definitely growing our, our message and our movement throughout the world. One more, or not? Yeah. Would like application process wise? Uh, no, I don't think colleges do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have to be applying. Yes. Okay, and then I have one last one. Um, what age were you when you realized you wanted to change the world? I, I wouldn't say it was like a certain age. I, I kind of like just grew into it. My mom's a, a marine biologist. She works at IMET with many of the other people here. And um, so I think going to her lab all the time as a kid, seeing all the animals, seeing all the animals and fish here as a kid, I think was just really tying to nature, going back to India all the time, seeing the nature over there. I just kind of was always kind of like felt connected. And I feel like I always had to stood up and stand out for people. Um, but, but I think when I was like 12, I, I became vegetarian and I became more of like an animal rights activist. Um, I think that kind of segued and geared me towards the climate movement as I saw how many animals are gonna be affected by the climate crisis. Well, that concludes our discussion. Thank you again for joining us with this really important topic and important discussion. Um, future events are in the works. Speakers and dates will be announced soon. Please visit aqua.org slash lecture for more information about the series and to watch past lectures. If you're on our email list, you will receive information about future lectures as soon as it's available. You can also visit aqua.org to join our email list and find more information about lectures and other events. Thank you again and have a wonderful night.